Restoring the Culture is hosted by Tanya Taylor Rubenstein, Story Mentor, and Camille Adair, Family Constellation Facilitator. In this podcast, these long-term friends explore how stories serve our lives. Their inquiry meanders into the realms of science, theater, health, and consciousness, moving the individual and global narratives forward as they draw upon their relationship as the laboratory for their experiments in truth. So many of us feel isolated and alone in our deepest longings. Each one of us is necessary in rediscovering the truth of our human story and listening to what is calling us forward so that we can restory the culture together. Okay, welcome to Restoring the Culture. Today we are talking about restoring leadership. This is Camille. I'm here with my friend Tanya. I'm going to begin by reading a quote by Clarissa Pinkola Estes from Women Who Run With the Wolves. This is chapter one. I must reveal to you that I am not one of the divine who march into the desert and return gravid with wisdom. I've traveled many cook fires and spread angel bait round every sleeping place. But more often than getting the wisdom, I've gotten in delicate episodes of E. coli and amoebic dysentery, such as the fate of a middle-class mystic with delicate intestines. It might seem like a strange quote for leadership, uh, but today Tanya and I are going to talk about how leadership is changing for us. So I'd love to hear from you after hearing that quote for the first time, Tanya. Well, it reminds me of my, um, what it took me to immediately was my first one woman show, Honeymoon in India, where I went to India with all these sort of like, ideas of a colonized person, that it was going to be very glamorous somehow, and I was going to get enlightened on the banks of the Ganga River. And instead, I got dysentery and parasites, you know, and almost died, <laughs> and, you know, on a, on a train, you know, that was somehow out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, that was the awakening. The awakening was the discomfort the awakening was um, having to confront my privilege, my perspective as an American white woman with ideas of fantasies of enlightenment versus the hard, hard work, um, the discomfort on inner and outer levels to, I think, become ourselves. And that's what it took me to immediately. And when I think of leadership, I'm, I feel mostly that it's about how do we become ourselves or how do I become myself? Because unless I do that, I don't really have anything to offer. Everything else is artifice to me. So I love her. I love that book. I love that quote. And she always just goes right to the heart of, of truth to me. Yeah. So that's what I would say. What made you choose that quote? Oh, I think, um, I think part of it has to do with where we're at right now with the pandemic and how as a leader I'm feeling um, like I'm sort of groveling around in my own shadow stuff in the midst of birthing something new and that that feels like there's no avoiding that and somewhere in there is a gift. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I also can look back at times when I've been asked to step into leadership. And little did I know that, you know, leadership, especially in healthcare, uh, has pedestal energy. So there can be some inflationary stuff that comes with that, a lot of expectation and a lot of projection uh, mm. from other people who have are still, you know, working out stuff with parents or they're working out stuff with authority figures and really w how I think not just in healthcare, but sort of in um, the culture that I, I think we're working at restoring. It's really a setup because true leadership really is about authenticity and that's inner work. And most leadership training programs teach you how to step up on the pedestal they're not about how do you go in and work with your own 
material and face your own shadow and learn to basically be at the bottom, right? You push other people up from the bottom. It's the inverted pyramid. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I mean, and I think about that, sure, you're coming from the perspective of healthcare, from a particular industry, a particular paradigm. But I think in Western culture, um, we're addicted to giving our power away. Getting back to my show, Honeymoon in India, that I did years ago, that was for me a bottom around giving my power away in the guru paradigm. And I realized after following certain gurus, um, including American ones that wouldn't call themselves gurus, that my job and my work was to pull all that power out of projection back into myself and stop looking for the perfect mommy or perfect daddy, which is what I think happens when right, this sort of guru culture of putting people on a pedestal plays out. And I've put people on a pedestal and 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 had the experience of being wildly disappointed in them because that happens. And I've also had the experience of people putting me on a pedestal, which is the most dangerous place because then you're going to fall to the bottom when you've been put up. And my work as a leader, whether I'm working with people on their stories, their writing, doing my work as a theater director, working with people on business, has been from the beginning to navigate that and support people in in taking their own energetic back. So I'm a guide, not a guru. And I think that distinction is big because a lot of people want to be gurus, but there's a falseness to it, isn't there? There's a, and who wants to pull other people's energy away? What is that feeding in them? To me, um, it happens as leaders. It's going to happen. Like we're going to have to experience that. I don't think it's a pure path. There's no like just ascending to understanding this, but from life experiences, like I've had to look at my ego, what part of me wanted to either take somebody's power and let them elevate me in some way because it felt good to me, felt validating to my ego or give away my power so I wouldn't have to do the hard work. But the movement of my soul for me has really been down, down, down on the ground. So I, I think uh, the old, you know, old style leadership really kind of had this myth that you have to be something other than yourself if you're going to be successful in leadership. And I think I think the leadership that is birthing right now in the world is the call to be more like yourself, to be as authentic as you can be and to step into your own humanity. And that truly is what all of us are hungry for and what we're hungry for from each other because old style leadership puts up barriers to human intimacy and connection. And the new style of leadership really is all about human connection, interdependence, doing things together. You and I have talked about the two by two and about, you know, how the lone wolf model of leadership doesn't work anymore. I've seen that play out so much in in hierarchical leadership models in organizations. And, um, and I think one of the things I've seen that play into that can be really harmful is something that I call founder syndrome that people have a really hard time passing on their wisdom, passing on, passing the baton to the next generation. And, and, and as, a, as a previous hospice nurse, I've always linked the need for succession planning in an organization or in one's leadership role to the fear of death. Because if we can't come to terms with the fact that one day we're gonna die and how are we gonna leave our legacy and our work to keep it as alive as we can, if that seems appropriate for sustainability, um, you know, I think that 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 I've found that to be a challenge for many people. So leadership, real true leadership, is far from being a career pursuit. It really is a spiritual pursuit. It's some of the deepest. It's some of the deepest work we can engage in in terms of the cycles of birth and death and our place in all of that. I so agree. And and as you and I have both been on that path and seen each other and supported each other, witnessed each other, all these things over the course of 
this thing that it's um it's that thing where it, it demands everything. And I remember making a vow to the guru 29 years ago, I want to say, where I said at a park I at Esta in Estes Park, Colorado, at a little retreat center, 500 people. And in front of the guru, I said, I want to marry the truth with no possibility of divorce. She said, be careful, that's a dangerous vow. And it's interesting to me because at the time, I thought that vow meant, right, the devotion somehow to the guru, some kind of like this illusion I had, fantasy of awakening. But it's been this, um, this thing that strips everything, right? Like, take me down, like, like I said earlier, you like to such humility, right? To really no escape, no emotional bypass, no financial bypass, no intellectual bypass, like all the way down. And then who am I there? I think only in going low, do I find out what I'm made of, what the ego wanted wants the bypass, right? And to kind of go high. I think for me, anyway, that's been my path of leadership. Not, and each one of us, I think, are tested in a way that has to rub up against um, the fragmentation in our soul, the trauma, familial, ancestral, conditioned, whatever it is, right? It has to rub up against um, those hard places that we don't want to go. So, I'm curious to know, I mean, I'd love to have this conversation where we both speak to, because, you know, we're old enough, right? We're in our 50s. We're in our mid 50s. And so we've had enough life experience to experience leadership, both from what informs the kind of leader we want to be and how we've probably both been the kind of leader that we don't want to be. Can you talk a little bit about a time when you were a leader where you learned about leadership by making mistakes? I think the biggest mistake that I've made or been most vulnerable to make um, has been not having good boundaries from the start around expectations. Because it's, it's that thing where for me learning to love myself as a leader too and to just love and respect myself means laying out uh, very clear boundaries around what people are going to get from me and what they're not. Because when what they're not isn't laid out ahead of time, all the projections you were talking about um, can come on to us as leaders. Now, I've been a self-employed person for 30 years so I've been a theater artist and a writing facilitator and all of these things that I've done, uh, story story leader, story coach, a story worker really around uh, on my own as an entrepreneur. And I didn't have any business background. So I was always highly gifted in terms of getting people results like in the story work itself. But where it got messy was I didn't have sacred structures around me and I didn't really understand how to create them and have the boundaries of, of business not toxic business, but just like healthy business structures, the sacred masculine. And then it was much trickier and people would project more on me or like expect that if they had this amazing transformational experience with me, that meant they were automatically my friend. And that's been really probably the trickiest spot for me in leadership and where people have gotten disappointed in me, it was less about the work they did with me that then they felt that intimacy that happened in the work spilled over into friendship or social life. And so um, that kind of enmeshment was something that happened in my family with me and my mom. So that happened in female relationships with some of my clients who didn't, leave gracefully, I should say, or were angry or disappointed that I, because what would happen is I would try to give that to them. And that was my failing and my codependency until I couldn't. And then I just sort of be done. Like, okay, we're done. You know, and, and that, so that's a way that I've had to confront 
really the mother-daughter split in my family and the way it played out, it be was to allow people to project on me and that wasn't their fault, right? Because we're all just walking around trying to heal and get our needs met. So I had to step way, 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 way back and do a lot of inner work and stop committing to big projects with people until I could realign my boundaries and from that create a new kind of offering and way with working with people. So I think that's been the trickiest thing for me and my leadership and not feeling guilty for not being able to give more than I can, right? That's part of my own internalized conditioning I've had to shift and release. So what about you? Well, I think I could speak to the mistakes I made working as a leader in organizations and then mistakes that I've made working in my own business, you know, as a as a teacher and a healer. And I would say that the first one, because I worked, you know, at one point, I think I managed 60 people and I was overseeing two different offices. And um, there were some pretty significant values differences between myself and sort of how the company was being run. Although I wasn't real aware of that for a long time, and I was fairly naive about how systems work at that point. Um, So I think in a way, I mean, it was all kind of beautiful because there was a lot of permission, a lot of trust, and there was also a lot of messiness. So I kind of look at that as being like one of those classroom situations for me (laughs) where I learned a lot in, in, and in some of those ways were really great. And in some of those ways were really hard. So I think I've learned though about to be really clear about one's values are really informs how you enter into agreements with other people. And I think agreements and boundaries are really important as a leader. Um, I also think that, that I've had a tendency because I'm so specialized in my work to have dual relationships. And oftentimes specialty communities can be sort of incestuous. For and sure. In the, in the, <laughs> and in the beginning, it feels like it's almost romantic, right? Like I finally found totally. my tribe and exactly. it's so, so, so satisfying. And it feels so good, like when you feel like you have something valuable to offer and it's what people have been like waiting for. And I think that's also really can be super tricky. Um, and so for me, I've been really learning about how to navigate those waters and how to be a responsible teacher and healer, how to separate out teaching and healing so Mm -hmm. they don't bleed together, how to have Mm -hmm. my own supervision, uh, how to differentiate myself um, and to be able to discern, you know, where my place is and how Mm -hmm. much of myself to bring in to certain situations. So that's all. And, you know, that's really hard stuff to teach somebody. Um, It really has been for me like the school of life, you know, getting in there. I've been really fortunate to, I would say my strength around all the messiness of that learning curve has been my ability to apologize, to talk about the elephant in the room, um, to have creative dissonance, to have to be able to hold uncomfortable conversations and deal with conflict. Mm -hmm. But that it's also not easy, you know, like that takes a lot of energy. So yeah, that's been a lot of my learning in the last few years as a leader. And I think the other part of that is, you know, being a woman, being a nurse, Mm -hmm. being the oldest child, uh, you know, who, you know, has some fairly significant codependent tendencies where maybe I haven't spoken up Mm -hmm. soon enough. Like if I had spoken up and really known, you know, trusted myself in the beginning that maybe I would have been able to speak to something before, you know, things sort of developed in a bigger way or that an issue sort of had progressed into deeper waters. Um, So, yeah, I think speaking up early on is something that I'm learning about and, uh, I think as women, you know, I mean, it's it's interesting, you know, we don't always need to talk about, you know, the differences between us as leaders. But I do think for women as leaders, I think finding our voice and finding our power in ways that we're not 
replicating male leadership models is a trick. It is a trick. And not replicating male leadership models, but allowing ourselves as much voice and as much space as often men do. And I think that's been my strength. As you talked about yours, I was like, well, what's mine? Because that hasn't been mine. <laughs> we know that hasn't been mine. But, you know, and it can be off-putting. And it doesn't usually off-put men. As a matter of fact, other than you, all my closest friends are male, which I find interesting. Men have no problem with my power, my boldness, my audacity. As a matter of fact, they often want to partner with it, work with it. And though I've had fewer male clients, they've been some of my most appreciative and gone further because I think they meet me in my power and they love it. There's no sense of threat. And it's more like, oh, so my, I think my my boldness is it's a powerful part of sacred masculine. And we've talked about this because as, as a, I'm a woman, but energetically, I think I carry a lot of the male too. You and I have talked about this, or maybe both the masculine and feminine. I feel it inside almost like not a split, but a 50-50 almost percent integration of, of how I lead. And I do think the sacred masculine is beautiful, but I think one thing I my strength has been modeling um, the ability to speak what we've been taught should be silenced or that we've been taught as women is unspeakable, though with men, it's totally allowed. Now, some women, you know, are very triggered by me um, around that and others have been wildly empowered. So, you know, I think everything in all of us can be held as a deficit or a gift and for me, so much about leadership is how do I compost things and restructure things in myself so that they can be more and more of a gift, not a deficit, and the acknowledgement that we're not going to please everyone, any of us. Not everyone's going to like any of us, and that that can really be okay. Um, and that the the deeper embrace is on the inside, right? One of the things that you and I have talked about that I feel pretty excited about is you know, sort of honing in on some of these concepts, not only concepts, but experiences. And from the experiences, we've identified some pretty specific principles. And as we're going through this big changing time with the pandemic, and so many businesses are losing their footing or going out of business or having to restructure, and we talk about restoring leadership in business, mm -hmm. and what that's one of the things I'm pretty excited about participating in yeah. because I think all these opportunities to really speak to how do we humanize leadership? How do we bring sustainability practices to leadership? Um, I think that we're coming into a time where a lot of what you and I have been working on will be increasingly welcomed uh, in, in larger organizations. And it's a lot of the larger organizations that have so much impact on human lives. Oh, yes. Totally. Yeah, I'm excited about it, too. And, you know, I come out of um, the artistic and creative world, but also the entrepreneurial world and have been part of some cohorts and whatnot. And I'm really seeing how things are shifting. Um, people and leaders who seem to be doing well, right, that, like through this, number one, have the willingness to ride the wave of the mystery into the unknown, are talking behind the scenes about tracking their own emotions going wildly all over the map, up and down, as you and I have been talking about, but the embrace of that, but that there's this more, what I'm seeing too is, um, you know, we have so much weight at the top in our culture, so much um, greed, <laughs> so much, you know, overtaking, manipulation, corruption, all of this. And even in entrepreneurial circles, I've been had some discomfort around some of the rates people charge simply because they can. I've been looking at my own way of pricing and structuring and knowing that I want to have models that are more egalitarian, that can serve the many. And I feel like the big places right now where there could be a great opening or 
are inside organizations that serve the many and insert and even with entrepreneurs uh, to shift from serving just like the one or fewer at a high, high rate. The work right now is to find ways to be in service of the many. And I do feel like there's this beautiful, more egalitarian thing. I see it as a circle, a circle rather than the top down, moving from patriarchy to matriarchy. And, you know, that that thing of all of us in the circle finding our places and all of us in the circle having opportunities. And it's one thing I know from my work as an entrepreneur, we all have opportunities, but people don't know all how to take advantage of the opportunities are there because they haven't been taught. And then these super elite programs once again, whether you're looking at an MBA from a high, Ivy League school or you're looking at a high ticket entrepreneurial thing that only the few can access, I feel like there's a breaking open now around inviting more and more people into the circle and restoring structures from hierarchies, right, to, to circles. Yeah, I, it reminds me of when I was a manager in hospice, I used to send people out in pairs. And I remember thinking, I know I'm paying two people, but I can tell that the like the alchemical shift that's going to happen when two people go out and market mm-hmm. or two people. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't all the time. Not every nurse went out in pairs when they would see patients. But oftentimes I would send two people out so that it would be like a social worker and a nurse or a chaplain and a, and a social worker. And they would go out together And there would be incredible things that would happen, not only in the delivery of care and leadership from that standpoint, but how the community responded to them when they actually saw them together. It was as if the community would light up (laughs) at seeing more than one person from an organization show up in order to talk about the care of a dying person and how they could be of service, right? And you and I have had a lot of conversations about co-leadership and I think um, we'll definitely be doing more specific podcasts on this in the future and Mm -hmm. we're wrapping up here in the next couple minutes but is there anything that you'd like to say about the this idea of co-leadership as part of a new paradigm well I love the the word you just used alchemical it's alchemy when two or or more are gathered right with some purpose um it's not one plus one equals two, it's two. And then that third thing that has created this much bigger, really quantum thing. And how on leaders, when we allow ourselves to share power the way you and I have practiced doing for 20 years together and in other circumstances, and we find a way to do it, we're the greater uh, it, the sum is greater than its parts, but it's also, it's lighter on us. So it's a lighter leadership. I think when we think of leadership, we can think of a weight, a heaviness. Oh my gosh, it's all on me, this heavy thing. I'm going to make this happy thing happen. But that two together, you and I have experienced this, including producing some huge projects together. Together, it's all lighter and there's an ease to it that lets allows things. So just, I think it's untapped in the sharing of power. And I, I love that you send people out like that on pairs and like, what a sort of more celebratory and lightness thing. And again, not one person is carrying all the weight of any given situation, an outcome. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of that, that vision I had of the lotus flower that turns into this, this Taurus where the outer leaves fall away and turn under and they become recycled into the big, the middle of the flower that then continues to open up and reveal something mysterious at its core. Mm-hmm. And that in a way, this kind of shared leadership model is like that. There's some kind of a creativity that is much greater than its parts. And um, I look forward to, to talking more about this in the future. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you for joining Camille and Tanya for this episode of Restoring the Culture. If you are inspired, we would deeply appreciate it if you would leave a review on iTunes or any other platform where you heard our podcast. For more ongoing inspiration and support, 
please join our no-cost global Facebook community, Restoring the Culture. You can support our podcast by making a donation here. And remember, we are each restoring the culture as we restory our own lives. See you next time.